I'm Eric Malcomian. I'm the president of Swedish Society for Emergency Medicine, and I work as a emergency physician in Stockholm and in a town called Eskilstuna, and also work a lot in pre-hospitally. And my name is Rani Toll. I work as a senior consultant at the University Hospital of Linköping, but also in a smaller community hospital of Motala. And I'm also a specialist in emergency medicine. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Wilhelms. Um, I'm an emergency physician and associate professor of emergency medicine in Linköping University Hospital, which was one of the first hospitals in Sweden to adopt emergency medicine as a specialty back in 2006. Typically, like, do you experience boarding at your ERs norm in the pre-COVID days? Would you have patients waiting, like sitting, waiting to get admitted in your hospitals due to lack of be inpatient beds. Yeah, yes. yes. There, is, there, is, there are big differences across the country. Um, about a year ago, uh, we did a national cross-sectional study. Uh, so we have about 70 emergency departments and we got about 50 of them to participate in this study. And in about half of them, at any given time, you will have at least one or two patients who are boarding but there is a huge span in the waiting times for these patients. So if you look in the major hospitals in the capital area or the other major cities, there could be patients waiting for like five to 10 hours to get admitted. But in the smaller hospitals in, or in the rural areas, the waiting time would typically be just half an hour, maybe an hour, and it would just be one or two patients at a time. So five or 10 hours would be a long time? It, it's so different because between hospitals, even in Stockholm, we have big five bigger hospitals and the two big uh, biggest ones i mean one of them sometimes you can have boarding up to 24 hours of 10 patients uh, while the other one more or less doesn't have any problems ever with boarding if it happens it's a couple of hours maybe three uh, so it's also which how how the hospitals are working and what what they're doing because each hospital has a specialty is it they're working different ways. Some hospitals have more tougher patients with tougher diagnosis and socioeconomic worse areas to take care of, while others don't. Uh, poly, uh, the polyclinics are working better in some, for some um, hospitals than others. There's so many factors, even within Stockholm with the big five bigger hospitals uh, that uh, make the difference. But and the span, even in Stockholm is so big that from a couple of hours from a hospital that never gets worse than that to another hospital that sometimes can have five to 10 patients waiting up to 24 hours. And is that, do you think, to some extent because of style and inefficiencies <coughs> and things like that? Or is, it yes. because, or is it because the hospital is literally full? Or they're empty beds, but they're not clean or no one's managed to get them organized and things like that? No, they're always full of beds. That's, that's not a problem. This is about uh, way of working, not in the... ED, it's more how they work in the hospital with the wards, how they get rid of the patients, if right. you say so, from right. the wards. That's the biggest problem. But on the wards, yeah. if you took away the inefficiency, would there be empty beds at all times or, or is the hospital 100% full? It's hard to say because we have two, I mean, with the, the boarding, <laughs> how can I say this? The problem is all, we have beds, but they're not open due to lack of nurses. So we have wards that are closed. So we're going already above that. So we have maybe up to 100, 200 beds in Stockholm total uh, that are not open due to lack of nurses. So you had nurses would have 200 more beds. So we're working of a capacity that's first of all, 200 beds less in Stockholm. The second thing is that the beds we have, we're using a capacity before uh, COVID uh, about, 90% plus, even sometimes 105% up to that level. So we always are working in, in Stockholm at least at that level. So it's, it's tough. So you don't really have surge capacity? No. no. And and that has, yeah, and that has changed also just to give some perspective. Yes. So if you look at the Western OECD countries, Sweden at this time has the lowest number of available hospital beds per inhabitant. Hmm. And, that was, and that has happened over the last five to seven years. So there has been a dramatic <clears throat> decrease in number of available hospital beds. And I think already just before this COVID crisis started, we were more or less at a breaking point where 
most hospitals were still managing fairly well, but they were always close to the tipping point where you would start getting a long boarding time for most patients because the hospital was full. Gotcha. Interesting. One should add, I think, this with um, disposable beds. We always relate to nurses. We don't lack nurses if we look at the amount of nurses in the country uh, or doctors. It's more what we are doing. So a lot of nurses are lost to administrative tasks rather than working on the floor. So that is the major cause, I would say, to the lack of nurses. Not that we are in lack of numbers, but those doing the patient close work. So say. Okay. Can you give us a view of what is happening on the ground? So as we understand it, here we closed down, we flattened the curve because we didn't have hospital capacity. And as we saw in New York, uh, we overran hospital capacity, 50 intubated patients in the emergency departments, uh, high mortality rate, not as bad as Italy, um, but still quite bad. And we understand that what you, your government decided, your public health people decided was to um, be much less aggressive about flattening the curve, allowing this to run through their healthy population. And um, we just want to get a sense of what happened. Did you get overwhelmed with patients? What's happening in the emergency departments? So we've established that you don't have this extra capacity, which we thought you must have, that you're running full. So what happened in the hospitals? Give us that picture. Happen generally that the main problem was in Stockholm because we had the most patients uh, in the beginning and still have the most patients. Uh, was that more or less everything planned when it came to surgery and orthopedics stopped? So, due to that, the wards opened up lots of places that the elected patients didn't need to come in. So, we could fill them with uh, COVID patients. And, uh, and then they stepped up with the ICU places. We tripled our ICU places within two weeks in Stockholm. Uh, and with that, people, yeah, we could manage. How did you triple the ICU beds and did you have enough ventilators for each of those beds? In, I don't know how it's internationally, but more or less each uh, OR is a ventilator. So they could use those. Uh, they managed to get other ventilators. I don't know exactly where they got from. Uh, military had some ventilators. Uh, their simple ones were still working. So they collected them. They made, made the OR rooms to three bed ICUs. Uh, and the anesthetist nurses started working there. The surgeons and the orthopedics were taught to read blood gases and do simple doctor work and did that. And everybody just helped. We had the uh, med students jumping in and working as. Uh, nurses in a way uh, everybody this but the prop difference is that uh, there's not enough doctors ICU doctors and ICU nurses so instead of one ICU nurse having two patients they usually have four patients uh, so the care is maybe not the same but we manage and did you get a huge number of patients coming through the emergency department try and sort of tell us what that looked like so you increase your ICU capacity threefold, but did you get overwhelmed with patients? No. 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 <laughs> Generally, you can say everybody uh, got 15 to 30% less patients to the EDs. And the, the, the patient types totally changed. Was majority was corona patients, and the other patients just disappeared. We don't know where. Uh, we have lots of registries in, in Sweden. One of them is the heart registry that registers different things. And they have noticed 40% less registries uh, during this time. And we don't know where those 40% of patients went. They're just not coming to the EDs anymore. Mm. And also we, we have an, uh, at least a, a budding emergency medicine registry, which has about 40% coverage on the national level at this at this time and we can see that general number of visits has decreased with about 25 percent since the beginning of march um, if you compare it to last year and it seems like a lot of low acuity issues actually don't show up in the emergency department now a lot of low acuity cases don't come and the reason for that is obviously unclear at this stage, but it might be a combination of the fact that restricting 
social contacts at least a bit uh, might decrease the number of just general infections spreading, but it might also be that people are actually doing less silly things like being drunk and having accidents and that sort of thing. Uh, but that remains to be determined in detail, of course, but we have seen a decrease in the number of visitors. And, and at least in our hospital system, yes. uh, there hasn't been a huge burden of COVID patients either. I mean, at some days there have been several who have been really ill but but i think the major strain in our hospital system has actually been on the icus and to some extent in the in the wards um and in the general wards general wards and intermediate care what we also did was to um uh, go out uh, so the general population got the information that there is a risk of crowding at the emergency rooms so please think before you go so a lot of the anxiety patients, for instance, have disappeared. Uh, another thing that uh, we did is that the general practitioners, which uh, they have a, a very big uh, part of the, uh, the health care of the, the patients in our country, uh, and they have been preparing old patients, best, taking time to prepare them. So uh, old patients that came in and often got something done that perhaps could have been done at home in their homes, elderly homes, uh, they were prepared so that the nurses could do what they needed at home. And what we also did was to go out and say, at least in our region, uh, phone the, the consultants. We have a direct line to the paramedics and to the general practitioners in, in our region. So a, a lot of phone call, calls came to us so we could decide or help um, treating at home either with paramedics or nurses uh, in the districts uh, being responsible for the patients at home. So that way, diminishing the amount of patients coming in for unnecessary treatment that could be done on distance or, or, or on a lower level care. Given all this, it doesn't sound like you believe that there were extra deaths due to the hospitals, any part of the hospital, the emergency system or the ICUs being overwhelmed. Um, do you have a sense of what percentage of the patients who died from COVID died in hospital or died in a nursing home or hospice or home? So it's tricky to, to answer that question because they have only lately started to um, give numbers on a national level for, separately for those who die in nursing homes and for those who die in, in the hospital. So up till just about a week ago, uh, there hasn't really been any good numbers um, on these separate categories of patients. But now it seems that actually I think a majority of the patients die in nursing homes yes. at this time. That's also one issue. They phone us uh, as, as consultants uh, and have a discussion. I have this patient with these symptoms. And if I say, I think this is more a COVID, uh, looks like COVID symptom, we discuss what would hospital care add to someone who is 95 years old uh, with dementia and so on? What is the prognosis? And often these discussions with very old patients uh, where we already from the working plan of a general practitioner think a, a palliative approach is good. We decide at this stage, stay at home. If the patient is not suffering, stay at home. Uh, so a lot of these decisions have been made before the <coughs> them to enter uh, but as you say there's we, we don't have the numbers on everyone yet that might have died at home and, and there's another problem with that also is that you need to we don't, we don't test everyone that dies and we don't do autopsies everyone that dies so if you suspect someone has a cold and uh, dies in and we, we just write the, on the death certificate it could be COVID-19 and there there's your statistics so that's, it's not 100% that one either, that we know is for sure that it, they died of COVID-19 or not. So in the medical community, as best you can tell, what is the reaction to your country choosing to take a, a lighter touch, putting more responsibility on citizens for using good judgment and less structural changes to society? Is, is the medical com community applauding that or worried about it in terms of its consequences on um, on the death rate or workloads, or what, what's the general sense? 
think the general sense is positive because so far we have been able to manage the inflow of patients uh, and be it's different different in different regions uh, as Aaron say but so far in our region uh, I think the approach has functioned because we have had reserve capacity uh, to take more patients if it's necessary it has been on the limit with the ICU units uh, some days but so far I think the strategy has worked very well yeah but, and I think it's also a matter of perspective mm -hmm. so if, if you look at northern Europe for instance all other countries in northern Europe have taken a much more restrictive uh, approach and I think the, the most extreme approach is represented by Finland mm. which is our eastern neighbor um, and and they basically decided to shut down the schools they restricted even travel nationally so traveling between different regions within Finland was prohibited for some time and and I, I think that these very different decisions made by different governments in our part of Europe created a lot of political tension at an early stage. So when this all started in March, there was a lot of political animosity uh, happening because we were told that you're, you're very irresponsible in Sweden because you, you, you don't seem to be taking this seriously. But now over time, when we see that it seems like the impact becomes rather similar no matter what approach you, you have been taking. Um, I think this criticism has actually veined quite substantially. So now, for instance, Germany is talking about having Sweden as a role model to actually decrease the restrictions and sort of, sort of starting up society again. So I, I think now when it's less political and more a practical approach to how, how things could be managed, there is less tension, but there was a lot of tension at the outset. We, we thought that you were crazy. We <laughs> thought that this was going to explode, blow up in your face, uh, Swedes dead in the streets. And that <laughs> didn't happen. Dave, do you have any sense of why? Like, why do we have a New York? Why do we have a Lombardy in Italy? And then we have Sweden that it doesn't look like it's been, they've been very lax and no explosion. Culture, I think, uh, is the answer. Um, there's, there are lots of memes before this happened, uh, how Swedish people line up for the bus. It's at least two meters between each person. Uh, we keep our distances, we have our bubble. We don't want to come close to other people usually. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have the same culture like that. I think, first of all, is that. The second one, we trust our government. If our government recommends something, uh, we follow that recommendation. Uh, we don't go against the government, it's more or less our parents. So that's also a very big, important fact to consider. Uh, uh, so both of those actually helps how it worked in Sweden. So it, it worked, that's how we are. We are like, <laughs> I think it's a big cultural thing, but in North Italy, they usually go out and sit close to each other, have, they have that interaction, maybe we don't have the same way in Sweden. Um, that decreases the spread just naturally at that point. Yeah. The average age of a Swede is 41 in the States, it's 38. So it's certainly not explained by a big difference in the average age of the population. No. Right. But it could also be a matter of population density, obviously, mm. because I, when, when Americans ask, because usually it's, it's difficult to know how, how big a country is. I, I usually say that Sweden is the size of California, um, but the population is about the, the, the same as New York City. So you spread out New York City in all of California, which creates a lot of natural space mm. between cities, between towns, and also between people. So there are only a few places in Sweden where you actually have this really urban population density, which I think also naturally creates less opportunities for dispersion of, of something contagious. I mean, in Stockholm, I think uh, it's about at least half of them uh, of the households here in Stockholm are single households uh, and the most affected areas of Stockholm uh, are the socioeconomic uh, different areas and also with lots of more foreigners there and they live differently they live in generations like they mostly do in Italy when you can yeah. live two or three generations in the same household so the spread is more so in Sweden we don't have that spread because of that also in the areas we had the spread it looked more like 
in Italy. So, you know, one of the interesting questions is, is you may have a higher death rate than some of your neighbors, but if you reach herd immunity faster, by the time they get there, their death rate may, have, may, may catch up. So my question would be, I've heard some reports that in Stockholm, maybe 25% of people are running positive serologies on, on random tests, uh, less so in the countryside. What numbers are you seeing or hearing? Uh, we've also heard the 25% in Stockholm, and they tested the population of one hospital, uh, the people working there, uh, and they got up to 20% uh, had, had it already. But we haven't noticed the leave of the people working so much. So they've probably been asymptomatic mostly. I, I think about 10 to 20% is, is sort of the range that you see in most studies. It, it's obviously still a bit lacking because there hasn't been a major study taking or, or doing serologies on several percent of the entire population like Iceland, for instance. So <clears throat> I think it remains to be determined what, what these numbers are in the actual general population. But as, as audience says, like in, in, in hospital workers, for instance, it's, it's around 20% in, in several places. And have you heard of any colleagues who've gotten significantly ill from the illness? Oh, we've yes. been treating several, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. We have. Interestingly, I think in our uh, clinic, we have had only 14 or 15% uh, um, that have had corona. Yeah. yeah. And I think we're supposed to be quite exposed, but it has been much worse yeah. in different clinics. Definitely. But we have had a few colleagues who have spent time in the ICU mm. uh, also here. Um, and, and without revealing too much, I, I'd say most of them have had comorbidities. So we haven't really seen anyone young and healthy uh, catching it and ending up in the ICU you, yeah. amongst our colleagues. But there are instances on a national level. Can you give me a sense of what's happening uh, again? We've got to be very careful of the media here, but it looks like all of the restaurants are open and life is basically going on as normal, or is that not true? Not completely true, I'd say. Uh, we have restrictions not to be more than 50 people. A lot of meetings are because of that cancer. The traveling have, has gone down with 90%, incredible amount yeah. of uh, decrease of, of traveling. Uh, it's a, a society with a lot of. Uh, uh, internet equipment so we have really been that has been exploding zoom meetings or, or meetings over these kind of media so it has definitely changed uh, but of course we can go out and eat if we respect the restrictions that are given and a few restaurants in Stockholm we know have been closed because they have not followed the restrictions uh, and we are of course free to go out in the parks as long as we respect those restrictions but, and, but typically, so walking home now on a Saturday evening, we will see people sitting outside oh, on yes. the restaurants having a beer, and, and that would be, it would look more or less like a normal Saturday evening, just with people seated uh, a bit more, with a bit more distance. Yep. And you're having meetings at the hospital on occasion, but you're trying to sit in every third seat or something like that in an auditorium style setup? Something like it. Yes. We're, we're not really respecting it right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different flavor than we get here. We're, we're sort of told by the media that you're just, everything is normal and you're just letting it go. But it's clear that that's not what's happening, that you're rule followers and you're, um, you live the way they're asking us to live, you know, mm -hmm. separately, distanced, not traveling. So it seems a little bit similar than that, the physical geography. So Dave, do you think that explains all that or is it that's, they have a whole bunch of nursing homes with dead people piled up in the back they're not telling us about. <laughs> oh, no, I, I think they are telling us about them. Um, I mean, if you look at the rates, they're running over 10% of the people who've tested positive um, are dying. But again, the, if you look at the age distribution, it is largely people who are, you know, very, you know over 80 years old is, is, a, is a shockingly large percent, not shockingly, but is a disproportionately high percentage of the people who are, who are dying. Um, and so that's the reality at this moment. I think there are a couple things to consider. One is, in any particular country, we don't yet know how many cycles of spread occurred before it blew up, before, and before social distancing was implemented. So one analysis is, it's all, 
it's equally virulent everywhere and equally likely to spread, but social distancing started at different times. So, you know, imagine one Petri dish that is going about to go from 10 bacteria to 100 bacteria, and you put in social distancing, and another Petri dish that's about to go from a million bacteria to 10 million bacteria when you put in social distancing. It looks very different, even, the social, even though the social distancing has the same effect. And it may just be that New York got a couple cycles down the road and really blew up before they put the brakes on, whereas everybody else, just because of the way that it spread around the world, got a chance to put the brakes on earlier. Plus, you know, the, the density of the New York subway system uh, is, is different than, than in other countries. And uh, the fact that everyone uses it, that there isn't sort of... Um, kind of separation where different groups of people tend to be socially isolated from each other in New York, which is different than other cities in the world. And, and, and certainly in my city in Los Angeles, people tend to use different forms of transportation depending on their socioeconomic status. And so if the disease starts in one particular group, it tends to stay in that group, at least for a time, uh, just by the nature, of the, inter the nature of intermixing or lack of intermixing. Um, so all of these things, I think, play into it. I don't think always that to die in the ICU is a worthy death. Mm -hmm. So these discussions have been quite wide among us and also with our colleagues, uh, the general practitioners. So uh, I think that is one of the good things that have happened due to COVID, that we have been discussing much more about our own <clears throat> patients. How do they want to die and what, uh, what is a worthy death and where? And I think this is something that hopefully came out good by COVID, that, that we discussed this much more with, with the patients and their families. What do you really wish? And what, what can we offer at a hospital? Yeah, that, I think that is one of the things we'll grow out of this, as well as the point that you guys made earlier, that where have all the patients gone? And which raises the other question, which is how many of those patients really didn't need to, to be there in the first place? And the way that emergency medicine has sort of grown into everybody's favorite clinic, maybe it's time to kind of pull back from that and figure out that doing a better job in other realms will keep patients out of the emergency department, which, mm -hmm. at least in the States, you know, our care is terribly expensive. It's, it, it, obviously, a lot of this is just how people bill and things like that and all the artifacts of our system. But, um, but you know, I wonder whether things will change as a result of this. Because we have put a lot of emphasis due to that uh, on our communication with uh, our colleagues, the general practitioners. Because mm -hmm. I think that if we increase our communication and cooperation with each other, we can spare a lot of patients the, a visit to the emergency. I think that's right. I agree with you guys, but the problem is uh, the STEMIs are the same amount, but the non STEMIs are half. How do you get 50% of the non STEMIs disappear? because of COVID. I have a theory that it's because that a lot of these are inflammatory based and we have reduced the total burden of virus in the population, which may have been a trigger for inflammation and plaque rupture because it's, it's so reduced. It's, I don't think it's explained by just them staying home. I think there's actually a real reduction. That's my theory. I'm going to get a Nobel. Yes. <laughs> well, what we need to do is we not, need to have a group of people do finger stick troponins daily. <laughs> at, at, at home and we'll just see whether your theory is correct now yeah we should do serological testing on the population and a couple of troponins as well and then we can prove it there we go <laughs> all Thanks, right everybody. good night everybody thank you, thank you very much